a satellite East European communist state tried to break free of the Soviet yoke. This was the beginning of my new left experience. For the new left, what it meant for me was that space in politics which was defined by the Soviet invasion of Hungary and the invasion of Egypt. Somewhere in between there, the idea of a democratic, socialist, anti-imperial politics was born. In England in 56, this was really a cultural explosion. I mean, there was the new music and the new stars, but most important of all, there was this huge pent-up energy and feeling behind it all. Youth culture seems to me to be about several kinds of rebellion and pop music is the sound of that rebellion in progress. After 56, we started a thing called Universities and Left Review, and that was very much edited by the Oxford group, myself, Raphael Samuel, Charles Taylor, and Gabriel Pearson. We were sort of the spokespersons for this whole larger enclave we've been debating politics and also politics and culture we were looking for an alternative more humane more just more inclusive less racially driven less patriarchal in its forms than either of these two cold war alternatives We used to think of it as part of a very personal, private crisis. We used to think of adolescence as a secretive period in our lives. And the difference is that these crises and tensions are now being lived out publicly on the stage. They're being dramatized in the music, in dress, and so on. Adolescence is also a period of idealism and addiction to great causes, when people express their rebellion against the misery, hypocrisy, violence, destructiveness of the world around them. The coffee bar has been opened by a small group of young people from Oxford, who having already successfully launched a magazine, now want a meeting place for the left and a source of income for their publication. The aim is to provide a place where people will sit and talk, and preferably talk politics. The first person I met was a secondary modern school teacher who had recently left Oxford. You're angry about a government that's been steadily eroding welfare state in spite of what a welfare state's done for a lot of people in the last say 15 years we're very angry about a generation of young people that have grown up i think without any kind of real moral or political leadership we're angry about the evasions of two parties on very important questions like cyprus and kenya and colonial policy generally but the two parties surely argue about all these subjects and have their policies but you have another one that you think's better they argue in the house The murder of Kelso Cochran was almost the first time that there's a national black presence on the British streets around an issue. A black man who'd been murdered at a street corner in Ludwig Grove by four or five white youths. That's when people become aware, not just that their community black struggles going on, but that there's a national black politics emerging. And the New Left Review, the magazine you edited... Yes, we started in Oxford a small journal called Universities of the Left Review, and then there was another journal started mainly by people who had left the Communist Party called the New Reasoner, and these two journals came together to form New Left Review. 
people who ought to have edited had really exhausted themselves in the struggles around to found these journals. And so me, in my early 20s, found myself editing these uh, grand figures. My childhood was the experience of passing through a set of negative definitions. And my parents patrolled who I could and couldn't bring home. They had to be the right class and the right color and the right education. They had to have the right hair and the right background, the right name. They saw me as an aspiring young scholar who's going to go away, conquer the world, and come back and adorn their struggles to improve themselves. Well, that is what I decided not to do. You see, so who am I? I am the person who is refusing that identity. trying to negotiate between notions of ourselves and of our cultural meanings and the values which enable us to live, which are not translatable from one to another. That's just the modern condition. Don't ask me whether it's going to go on being like that. That's how it is now, and I think it's been like that for some time, and I don't think it's just superficial confusion that makes us think that. I think it's a really new dynamic culturally across the globe, moving at different speeds across the globe, which gives us that kind of experience of what it's like to be in the modern world. Panorama tonight is devoting the whole of its time to one subject, the H-bomb. These various campaigns against the H-bomb will reach one climax at the coming weekend, when protest marchers from many parts of the country will converge on a quiet Berkshire village, Aldermaston. It's a small figure for a political party, but for a demonstration, it's enormous. And so is the figure of 800 people arrested for civil disobedience the other day. Stuart Hall sums up the hopes which people of the left have for the unilateralist policy. I think that Britain ought to give up the bomb unilaterally, renounce nuclear weapons and their manufacture and their use, and consider what more positive policies they can adopt in the future. Because I think it's very important that a country that's been right at the center of uh, the military buildup should in fact confront the problems of nuclear weapons and take a new course. I think the effect in the world of seeing a major power do that would have a profound effect. I don't think that a great deal is going to come out of discussions between East and West, either where disarmament or disengagement is concerned. It's going to come out of the United Nations, and this is the point at which the neutral powers could use the increased and added influence of a power like Britain in their support. see the way in which the balance of power has changed in the last five years as a result of the emergence of African nation, Latin American countries into the world scene, their renewed effect on discussions in the United Nations and so on. Their impact on world affairs has doubled or trebled in the last two or three years.
Once I got involved in New Left, then got involved in CND, I was on platforms, you know, speaking, speaking, speaking. There's certainly a view that politics is a very separate thing from people's lives and that it ought to be managed by a party hierarchy or people whose trained job it is. Now, this is, my view, a really dangerous thing because it leaves a lot of people out. It makes a lot of people feel that they, feel like, have no control over their lives, over their environment, over the kind of things that they do and so on. I went up and down the country speaking at CND meetings for about three years. I spoke nearly every weekend. I go to Halifax, and then there'd be a New Left editorial board meeting. I understood Oxford, I understood London, I understood the South, but Halifax is a completely different thing altogether. You could still see the smoke coming out of the chimneys. There were still textile mills. We often think of England as an old country. It's been settled for a long time, and it presents itself as a society in which there have been relatively little changes across history. But in fact, we know that successive historical changes have reshaped both the social and the physical landscape of England. Each of these economic and political transformations have brought a new class of persons into an ascendant position in the society. And as a consequence of that, they have constructed for themselves images of their own power and influence and transformed the economic and political relationships around them. The former colonial peoples of Africa, Asia, South America are now insisting on self-government, at least in part because they are determined to be treated as equals. I wanted to question the very sharp opposition which you make between the concepts of liberty and equality. This is not only an ethnocentric way of looking at it, but a peculiarly British way of looking at it. I think it has been the idea of equality which has really mobilized people to support nationalist movements of one kind or another. What they were facing were in fact inequalities, whether they were economic or human or social or racial, they were essentially inequalities. I think they impinged on their lives as inequalities. And therefore, when they said we want to be free, what they meant was we want to be free not to be unequal. My conception of culture was always of something which is changing. I've never believed in the absolute moment of break. When I went to Cuba in 1960 for the new left, people said, this is year one. From here, socialist man begins. It's not true. Cuba went on being partly what it was before the revolution. So I don't believe in absolute break. Thank you. 